This podcast from the 2007 Corporate Social Responsibility Summit is brought to you by MOSS, Models of Success and Sustainability. Session 1. Hundreds of corporations around the world are gaining major financial and competitive business by integrating sustainability into their core business strategies. Yet in spite of this great work, environmental and social conditions are declining rapidly. This begs the question, what's wrong with the sustainability movement? What else is needed? The answer is largely that much more attention must be given to improving overarching economic, political and social systems that essentially compel all organisations to operate unsustainably. In this opening keynote, Frank Dixon, CEO, Global Systems Change and the former Managing Director of Research for Innovest, the research analytical company who provides the research for the Global 100, the world's most sustainable companies, describes leading-edge sustainability strategies. He also unveils a system-change-based approach to sustainability called Total Corporate Responsibility, TCR, a practical, profitable, collaborative, business-led approach to driving the systems change needed to achieve sustainability. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you today in Australia through the miracles of modern technology. Uh, It's also a pleasure to be supporting the work of Moss and all that they're doing around the issues of corporate responsibility. I believe, as you'll see throughout my talk, that corporate responsibility and sustainability will soon become the the most important issue for society uh, in all countries, including Australia and that the work of Moss and those supporting Moss uh, will be seen as some of the most important work occurring at this time. So I want to start out by congratulate, congratulating you on all the good work that you're doing and saying it's a pleasure to be here uh, in supporting this. So uh, let's switch to slide two, please. Today I'm going to talk about the issue of sustainability uh, and how we can go about achieving it. Sustainability is something that essentially everyone uh, wants. It basically means prosperity now and in the future. There are many of us who realize that if we continue on this current course, we're not going to achieve sustainability. Uh, So we're working hard to improve. The corporate responsibility movement is growing rapidly, as I'll discuss, as is the socially responsible investing movement, and many many other efforts are growing to help us try and improve environmental and social conditions. But in spite of all this good work, environmental and social conditions are still declining. So it begs the question, what's wrong with the sustainability movement? What's missing? And the answer, I would say, largely is that uh, sustainability is not possible without system change. It appears that we're in the sustainability movement that we're focusing about 100 per, almost 100% of our efforts on about 20% of the problem. And the 20% of the problem would be what companies can do unilaterally to improve their environmental and social performance. But as we'll discuss today, what you see when you've been in the business in the industry for a while is that overarching systems greatly limit the ability of firms to mitigate their negative environmental and social impacts. So if we don't begin to shift some of the focus of the sustainability movement towards the issue of system change, I don't think we're going to be able to achieve it. I also another key point is that Australia has the potential to become uh, a real global leader on this issue, uh, as I'll discuss a bit towards the end of my talk. But um, I think sustainability is soon going to become the most important issue for human society. System change will become the most important issue uh, or aspect of sustainability, and Australia has the potential to become a leader of that. That's essentially what my talk will be all about today. Okay, so let's go to uh, slide three. From a business perspective, environmental and social issues uh, or the negative environmental and social impacts of firms have traditionally not been seen as being financially relevant. Uh, the, The human economy was small in relation to the earth system. It took a long time for corporate environmental impacts to be seen, so these were not considered to be financially relevant. In fact, addressing them was seen as a uh, dereliction of the responsibility to maximize shareholder returns. But that's changing. As the human economy continues to expand in the finite Earth system, as population growth continues, as living standards uh, continue to rise, we produce more pollution and consume more resources. 
Uh, as we do this, we're approaching and surpassing limits in the finite Earth system. When this occurs, it, um, companies get pushback for the negative impacts more quickly, uh, and this causes environmental and social issues to become more financially relevant for firms. This growing financial relevance is what's driving uh, the mainstream, mainstreaming of the corporate responsibility and socially responsible investing movements. I was the head of research at Innovest Strategic Value Advisors, the largest uh, corporate sustainability research firm in the world, for uh, seven years. M my job there was to manage 50 analysts who analyzed the world's 2,000 largest companies and essentially gave them grades for their environmental and social performance relative to peers. One of the things that I saw, uh, let's switch to slide four, please. One of the things that I saw was that companies were gaining a huge amount of financial and competitive benefits uh, from being proactive in corporate responsibility. It doesn't mean that everything that they did enhanced profitability, but the smart ones were doing corporate responsibility in such a way that caused them to improve profitability and competitive position. Some of the benefits that they were getting were enhanced reputation and brand value, as you see on this slide here, um, increased market share, lower energy materials and waste disposal costs, increased uh, or facilitated access to new markets and to resources. And one of the most important benefits was uh, reported by many firms was that employees increasingly want to work for companies that are not only making great products and services, but also doing a great job of taking care of the communities that their kids are growing up in. So sustainability leaders, corporate responsibility leaders are able to attract uh, and retain a higher quality, uh, better motivated workforce, which is becoming an increasingly important differentiator of competitive advantage. Okay, uh, let's go to slide five, please. I mentioned earlier that in spite of all our good work, environmental and social conditions are continuing to decline. This slide discusses that a little bit. All of the Earth's uh, life support systems are in decline, uh, with some regional exceptions. We've cleared about half of our forests, wetlands, and grasslands. We see extinction rates not seen uh, in 65 million years since a meteor hit the Yucatan and caused the dinosaurs to become extinct. Uh, global warming is accelerating as we pull literally millions of years of carbon out of the ground in a short amount of time, put it up in the sky as a heat-trapping atmospheric gas. It's uh, not surprisingly causing our climate to change. Soil quality uh, and aquifer quality is declining around the world. Um, every major ocean fishery is at its limit or in decline. We disperse about uh, 80,000 synthetic chemicals uh, that weren't present when humans were developing into the land, air, and water. These accumulate in our bodies and are causing increasing illness and birth defects, other problems. We're also dispersing uh, genetically modified substances, nanotech materials uh, that weren't present when life was evolving on this planet out into the land, air, and water. That isn't to say that chemicals, genetically modified foods, and nanotech materials don't provide benefits to society. Clearly they do, but they also have great potential costs which aren't being accounted for. Also, many of these substances are uh, usually, or most of these substances, you could say even nearly all of them, are not tested independently by third parties uh, for safety, and we'll discuss why that is shortly. Okay, on the social side, uh, social strains are also increasing around the world. As population heads up towards over 9 billion, uh, there's a widening gap between rich and poor, and many different studies show that many, if not most, of the young people, the 2 billion young people entering the workforce over the next uh, 20 years won't be able to find jobs. These are all a formula for increasing social instability and distress, uh, issues which are going to have increasing financial impacts on firms. Also, there's indications of social um, problems, even in prosperous regions. For example, in my country, the United States, uh, one third of us are overweight, another third are obese. We watch about six hours of TV per day on average, and there's wide, widespread and rapidly growing use of antidepressants. So it begs the question, in this most successful country, why is it there that there are so many people that don't seem to be happy or fulfilled? Okay, so uh, it begs the larger question, as I said earlier, why are we trying so hard to improve and yet heading in the wrong direction pretty fast? And I think 
The answer has to do with the idea that uh, we're making the same mistakes that past civilizations have. In the past, um, say in the times of feudalism, for example, people would look at their system and compare it to those before and say how much more advanced and sophisticated they are. But they couldn't, they couldn't see the problems with their systems, be it feudalism, communism, socialism, slavery, whatever the institution might have been. At the time, it was difficult to see the flaws of the systems. It would be illogical to assume that we aren't making similar mistakes today. We sit here with our current form of uh, our current economic and political systems and say, look at the benefits that they provide, and clearly they do. Uh, but it's difficult to see the costs that they're imposing on us because we're so close to them. We live our lives in them. We've been trained to work in them. They've provided lots of benefits. They provide our security. So it's difficult to step back and look at what's wrong with our current systems and how they are driving our environmental and social problems. One of the... Um, uh, Einstein said that we can't solve our problems from the level of thinking they were created. We need to think at a higher level. And that is probably the main reason why our systems are flawed, the failure to take a systems view. What we do is we, we focus on the well-being of the individual uh, and take the well-being of the larger system that supports the individual for granted. This made sense when we were developing our systems because human society was so small in relation to the total uh, system. But as we grow, it increasingly makes less sense. So, as Einstein said, if we want to solve our problems, we have to think at a higher level. That higher level is the systemic level. So one of the, one of the key things to uh, bear in mind uh, here on slide number seven uh, is that system change is inevitable. Sometimes people think we have the option to keep things the same. Things never stay the same. Any system, in particular, that's out of balance with nature or reality is bound to change. Right now, things are changing very quickly, even though it might not seem that way. Uh, it's inevitable that our existing systems will change. Uh, the only question is, will it be voluntary or involuntary change? If we continue to uh, take the position that our current systems could give us prosperity and sustainability, uh, we'll be choosing the path of involuntary system change. And these systems will have trouble the way communism did in, in the USSR not too long ago. So the suggestion here is that we should begin to look much more closely at how we can voluntarily improve our systems. Okay, let's go to uh, slide number eight. The, uh, the issue of system change is something that many people, uh, I think, understand. A lot of people intuitively get that there's something wrong with our economic and political systems. They're creating problems. Somehow we need to improve them. But the thing that's very difficult is the next question of what do we do about it? How do we change it? So that's what I'd like to focus on today. Uh, we'll talk about what are some of the uh, major system flaws and how they can pr be practically addressed. So let's talk, looking first at the big picture, at the main system flaw. I would say that our economic, political, and social systems are inherently flawed because they were developed from a reductionistic perspective. What I mean by that is it's difficult for the human mind to think of the whole Earth system at once. The mind's not p capable of handling all those details. So we break the system down into parts, economic, political, and social, and we develop uh, economic systems, for example, that through reductionism ignore many relevant aspects in other parts of the total system. Because these, these uh, economic ideas and systems ignore relevant issues, uh, they are inherently flawed. One of the things that these systems do is they put business in conflict with society. In other words, there's a conflict between shareholders and children sometimes, or shareholders and the environment. This is a no-win situation. It's not a company problem, it's a system problem. Um, so, uh, and I, as I said earlier, I, I would emphasize that it is probably these flawed systems, not uh, companies with not good intentions, that are, that are driving our environmental and social problems. So uh, there are many different specific environmental, social, and political system flaws, which I'll talk about in a minute. But if you were to look at the overarching flaw of our systems, I would say that it is the failure to hold firms fully responsible for negative impacts. The reason that that's a flaw uh, became clear to me at my work at, at, at InnoVest. Um, while working there, as I mentioned earlier, I saw thousands of examples of how companies were improving financial and competitive performance by acting more responsibly. 
but this was almost always true, only up to a point. Up to a point, you could make more money by being more responsible. But beyond a certain point, um, and perhaps just totally approximating, that might be 20% along the responsibility spectrum. Beyond a certain point, when companies continue to try to m mitigate or get rid of their negative environmental and social impacts, their costs went up relative to peers that weren't fully mitigating because they weren't required to. Uh, and if the company continued to act too responsibly by trying to mitigate all of its impacts, it would put itself out of business. So our systems, without ever intending to do so, have evolved in such a way that uh, being in business and being uh, fully responsible or sustainable are mutually exclusive. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is talk a bit about some of the specific uh, flaws of our economic, political, and social systems. And as I'm doing this, so let's switch to slide eight, please. I'm sorry, slide nine. Um, so as I'm doing this, I'm sure that some of you are going to be thinking, uh, how could we possibly address these issues? As I mentioned earlier, uh, previous civilizations, um, some people may have seen the flaws of feudalism and, and other systems at the time, but they're so large and overwhelming, we wonder how could we possibly do anything about it. I'm sure as I discuss these, these next state system flaws that people will be thinking the same thing. That's okay. The purpose here now is just to put these issues on the table. Uh, and then we'll talk about what could practically be done about them uh, later on. And I can say up front that there's no easy answers. There's probably no short-term answer either. The point here is just to begin the work. Okay, so looking at these economic system flaws, the first flaw has to do with externalities. This is probably the most well-known flaw of our economic system. It is the failure to incorporate all relevant costs into prices. One example of this might be coal-fired electricity. Uh, we know that burning coal causes, uh, here in the United States, thousands of premature deaths, hundreds of thousands of cases of bronchitis, uh, asthma, and other uh, lung problems. It causes birth defects from mercury emissions, uh, acid rain damage. These are all real costs that uh, increase income taxes, uh, public and uh, private health insurance costs. Uh, they're real costs that don't get included in coal-fired electricity prices. This creates the illusion that coal-fired electricity is cheap when it may be the most expensive form of power generation. The, this failure to incorporate relevant real costs into prices uh, applies to almost every product and service in our society. We talk about using the market system, um, but we're not even coming close to using it well. We send massive price distortions out to consumers, which results in extremely suboptimal uh, purchase decisions. Okay, um, another flaw of our system is the failure to uh, consider uh, limits to growth. I graduated from the Harvard Business School 20 years ago, and um, at the time they were, they were teaching what they're still teaching now. The most important thing is growth. Companies have to grow revenues and earnings to survive. Um, but in reality, uh, in the real world, nothing grows forever. Our bodies grow till we're 18 years old and then stop growing. If they didn't, we'd be 25 feet tall when we died. A forest grows to a certain level, then, then uh, levels off. The idea that a company or a national economy can grow forever without limit is, is just not logical. Um, and we're seeing the effects of not considering limits to growth now. When something grows forever, as in the human body, and begins to take over other things, that's a, that's a cancer. And, and in some ways, that's what the human economy is acting like on, on the earth now. So again, massive problems, no easy solution. And remember, I, I should point out that I'm a business person, not a social activist. So the reason I'm talking about these issues uh, is because they're creating increasing financially relevant impacts and problems for firms. And if we don't do something about them, business is going to uh, have a more difficult time uh, maintaining returns to shareholders. Okay, let's talk about another uh, economic system flaw. Uh, this is the way that we um, measure success uh, in, by looking at, at uh, GNP or economic growth. Um, economic growth is not what we care about. Economic growth is a secondary indicator. What we care about are the fruits of economic growth that families are prospering, that people have their needs met, that people have jobs, that the environment is clear now, clean now and in the future so that people can prosper then as well. 
Um, but when we don't measure the ends but measure the means instead, the means become the end. And we make the increasingly incorrect assumption that economic growth equals making the world a better place. That's true in some ways, uh, but increasingly less true in many others. So we need a much more sophisticated system of measuring the well-being of society than looking at one monetized number. It's, it's not possible to, to do that. They say in business, what gets measured gets managed. What doesn't get measured doesn't get managed. So if we measure only one thing, economic growth, everything else must take a distant second in priority. Children, the environment, jobs, whatever it is, must come in second. None of us intended that, but if we only measure one thing, then everything else has become secondary. Okay, another uh, system flaw has to do with time value of money. This provides, uh, an, uh, this is a great example in two ways. One, it's a perfect example of something that makes sense to the individual, but not to the whole system. And two, something that would be extremely difficult to fix. Um, so time value of money is the idea that money and things are worth more today and in the future. It makes sense to the individual because, for example, if I don't have, it doesn't matter if I have food 100 years from now. If I don't have it today, I'm not going to survive. So to the individual, clearly resources are worth more today than in the future. However, this uh, time value of money idea, which is the foundation of our economic system, uh, the discount rate and such, says that beyond 50, certainly beyond 100 years, people and the resources that would keep them alive are worthless. Therefore, from an economic perspective, acting to protect our, our grandchildren and the resources that would keep them alive would be a foolish economic decision. Of course, these are the people we care the most about, um, but our systems cause us to act in ways that, that indicate we don't care that much about them. Okay, um, and, and as I said earlier, that's an extremely difficult issue. Our whole system is based on it. There's no easy answer, but we'll come to the conversation about what might be done about that. Okay, let's go to slide number 10. Uh, look at some political and social system flaws. Uh, sorry about all the words on this slide. Uh, this, this is the only one like this, I hope. Um, but anyway, in terms of a political system flaws, uh, I said earlier that the overarching flaw was the failure to hold firms fully responsible for negative impacts. Only government can do that, ultimately. I mean, firms are held responsible by the market and consumers and other things like that, but ultimately only government can hold firms responsible in the same way that government holds individuals responsible for crimes. When we let regulated entities uh, influence regulators through uh, having private meetings by giving money to the politicians that oversee regulators, uh, it makes it impossible for the regulator to hold the regulated entity fully, fully responsible. It also forces governments to focus on short-term corporate profitability rather than on long-term prosperity, which is, uh, many would say, the primary obligation for governments to preserve the union for future generations, not to maximize short-term corporate returns. And another problem with allowing the regulated entity to influence regulators is it leads to corporate welfare or a large transfer of wealth from, uh, from present and future citizens to, uh, to the people that own most corporate assets. One, one quick example of this uh, would be uh, in the United States. I'm sure there are similar laws like this around the world. In the United States, there's an 1872 mining law that says that Companies have the right to buy minerals on, or rights to minerals on federal lands for $5 an acre. So under this law, a few years ago, uh, a subsidiary of Chevron was able to buy rights to platinum and palladium on uh, 2,000 acres of federal land for $5 an, an acre. So they paid $10,000. This platinum and palladium had an estimated market value of $30 billion. Now, those resources belong to American citizens, present and future. Uh, the profits from that sale might have paid for all federal elections for the next 20 years. So beginning to separate the regulator from the regulated entity is imperative. It's also difficult because our whole system works like that. But if we want to uh, give companies the right incentives, get, make it profitable for them to act responsibly, we must separate the regulator from the regulated entity. Another uh, political uh, or legal system flaw has to do with the limited liability structure. This is another example of something that makes sense to the individual but not to the whole system. 
Also another example of something that would be extremely difficult to change because our whole, uh, almost our whole economic system is based on limited liability. The idea of limited liability is that uh, firms and their owners are not held fully responsible for negative impacts. As we said earlier, when companies aren't held responsible in a competitive market, it creates a situation where they must act irresponsibly to remain in business. If they try to act fully responsible, they go out of business long before that or the CEO gets fired. Uh, so also, uh, so limited liability made sense uh, in, um, in the sense that it, we needed resources to build the railroads and other things like that. So this was able to bring in the resources to get the infrastructure built. But it has other problems that probably weren't anticipated at the time that these structures were developed. One is that owners receive an unlimited upside. They can, in theory, return an infinite return on investment. Uh, but the downside is capped at one times investment. So risk never goes away. It just gets transferred to someone. So if the investors have unlimited upside but capped downside, who, who covers the downside? The risk is transferred to the taxpayer. So if things go wrong, the taxpayer pays. If things go well, the investor makes the return. Uh, I, it would be difficult to find a factor other than this uh, dr that's driving the, the widening gap between rich and poor more than this. Um, another problem with the limited liability structure is that taxpayers are forced to clean up problems uh, rather than giving corporations the incentives to prevent them. Because it's not profitable for corporations to, not, to, to get rid of all their pollution, they must pollute, and then it, it's orders of magnitude more expensive for society to clean up this pollution. I mean, it's much cheaper to not put the chemicals in the groundwater than to try and remove those chemicals from the groundwater. In many cases, it's not even possible to clean up. We're not going to, in many ways, be able to clean up the ocean's atmosphere, groundwater, topsoil, surface water. So um, anyway, th this is a, a, another example. Limited liability, st liability structures of something that makes sense on one level but doesn't make sense on another level. I think it's an example of something that people in the future will look back on as, and not understand how we could have done this in the same way that we look back, for example, on some of the crazy things that people did in the past, like witch burning. But again, we're so close to it, we don't see how we can change it. Our paychecks are based on limited liability, so it's scary to even talk about this issue. But if we don't somehow put it on the table and try to practically deal with it, we're not, you know, it's going to deal with itself in a way that we don't like, and especially that our children won't like. Okay, um, so let me talk about a couple more uh, system flaws, then we'll move on to what we can practically do about them. Um, okay, so one of them has to do with uh, advertising, and these are, what we're looking at here are, are negative impacts on society that firms are not held responsible for. At Innovest, uh, my job as the head of research was to rate companies on how they were doing at mitigate, mostly at mitigating their negative impacts. Uh, so we were looking increasingly at things that companies traditionally were not held responsible for. One of them has to do with some of the more intangible impacts on society of advertising. Uh, we, asked, we, we spoke earlier about some of the problems in developed countries, not only the United States, I'm sure they're showing up in other developed countries like obesity, increasing depression, compulsive TV watching, gambling, whatever the behavior might be, begs the question, why is this going on? Why are people so uh, apparently so empty in these prosperous countries? I think one of them has to do with uh, uh, advertising. If the way we measure prosperity is with economic growth, then the job of the citizen is to, uh, to buy things. And advertising is used to create a perceived need or desire within the consumer. And the way that they do this is by um, taking advantage of people's uh, inner needs for self-esteem, love, and respect. Um, for example, in the United States, our kids see 100,000 commercials at least by the time they get out of high school. Each one of these says in a very powerful, nonverbal, emotional way, or most of these say that, your value, your happiness is based on what you look like, the type of car that you drive. Um, and so, you know, over time, this sends a message that, create, that, that contributes to a sense of emptiness in society. Uh, so, uh, again, I'm just putting it on the table. It would be something that would be very difficult to cheat, to uh, rectify. I mean, how do you even tell if an ad is non-verbally deceptive? I think mostly it's the, the field test, but... 
I also think it points out a huge opportunity in advertising and media to begin to sell products in a way that builds up society instead of makes it feel empty in many ways. Um, okay, the last system flaw I'll discuss is um, uh, the ability of firms to influence public opinion through media uh, and concentrated financial resources. One of the, um, uh, one of the interesting things is, uh, has to do with climate change. In the United States, for example, there are many people, many citizens, possibly approaching close to 50 percent that don't believe that climate change is a major issue or that it's caused by human society. This is, it's hard to understand this since every peer-reviewed scientific study says that humans are contributing to climate change. So it begs the question, how is it could, that so many people could be misled? And one of the answers, I think, is that at times firms will run their own studies that say climate change isn't a problem, then uh, using large amounts of resources, put them out over the airwaves, and the public, for example, in the United States, some of them might come to feel that climate change is a communist plot to destroy the U.S. economy uh, instead of the real problem that it actually is. So again, just pointing out uh, system problems, um, there's no easy answer, but let's begin to take a look now at uh, what could be done about some of these things. So let's go to slide 11, please. Um, the grow, there's growing awareness in the sustainability movement that systemic issues are, uh, are a component and possibly the major driver of environmental and social problems. Because of that awareness, there's an increased focus on system change. So you can uh, segment system change broadly into mid-level or high level. So if you're thinking about levels of corporate responsibility, the, the first level, the corporate level, uh, is represents more than 90%, maybe more than 95% of all corporate responsibility or sustainability activities. This mostly is looking at how firms can unilaterally lower their environmental and social impacts within existing economic and political systems. But as we've already discussed, these systems severely constrain the ability of firms to lower their impacts. So looking at system change at the mid-level has to do with focusing on a, sp a particular industry sector, a particular environmental or social issue, or a particular stakeholder group. There are lots of system change efforts like this going on right now, um, and these, these issues are growing quickly. Uh, the next level of system change uh, I would call high-level system change. This has to do with improving the overarching economic, political, and social systems that uh, basically constrain all sectors, constrain, constrain all of society from acting uh, sustainably. This, I would say, is by far the most important sustainability issue, but it receives the least amount of attention. So we'll talk about why that is and what could possibly be done about it. But let me just first give you a quick example of mid-level system change. I'm on the team that's advising Walmart on their very aggressive corporate responsibility strategy. Uh, Walmart is a smart company, as indicated by they're one of the largest in the world. Uh, Lee Scott, the CEO of Walmart in October 2005, announced some of the most aggressive, possibly the most aggressive, uh, environmental goals of any large firm. He said that Walmart would produce zero waste, use 100% renewable energy, and sell sustainable products. An interesting thing about these goals is that they're impossible to achieve in current systems. So, but they've set them as stretch goals, and it's an indication of Walmart's commitment to corporate responsibility. They're doing a great job with it. I'm in a good position to say that, having overseen the analysis of the 2,000 world's largest companies on these issues. I can say they're implementing one of the most aggressive approaches ever. What they're doing is focusing first on the environment, then on social. Walmart recognized that being a retailer, 90% of their negative impacts come uh, from the supply chain. So what they're doing is they're setting up sustainable value networks in different functional and product areas, uh, and then in each one of these, working with suppliers, NGOs, and other partners to lower environmental impacts. And they're doing a great job with it. In terms of examples of high-level system change, there really aren't that many. Uh, in fact, there might be... Uh, at, at looking at the whole system level, as I'll describe, there's probably uh, no one that's, that's doing that, um, except possibly for this company, Gaisley. Gaisley is a Walmart subsidiary based in the UK. I'm advising them on, a, uh, on their sustainability strategy, and one of the things that we're looking at uh, is this issue of high-level system change. 
They were beginning to implement an approach called total corporate responsibility and sustainable systems implementation, and I'll discuss what those are now. Uh, so let's go to uh, slide 14. Okay, so first of all, talking about um, the system change, let's look first at why system change has not happened and what's, what stands in the way of making it happen. One of the most important is complexity. In fact, this probably is the most important. We're talking about improving economic and political systems is probably the most complex challenge that business and society has ever faced. Uh, there's no easy answer. In the past, uh, society has not been able to deal with uh, challenges this great. Instead, uh, they remain within existing systems, and those, those systems ultimately collapse. So stipulating up front, there's no easy answer. This is an incredibly complex challenge. Another issue has to do with inertia. Because we focus on the well-being of the individual, it appears that our systems are very successful. We, they obviously provide great benefits. Many of us are living very comfortable lifestyles with new technology and medicine. There are all kinds of benefits that we get from our current systems in society. So that's wonderful. The problem is, is that these, these benefits, these advancements, are built on larger but less obvious failures, such as the decline of our life support systems, growing inequity, and growing unhappiness around the world. So the, when evaluating human systems, the first criteria is survival. If you don't achieve survival, nothing else matters. So our systems create the illusion of success by providing many benefits uh, while um, while seriously threatening our ability to survive. And this illusion of success creates inertia, which makes change difficult. Another one, a uh, barrier to system change, is the failure to take a whole system view. There, there are a number of high-level system change efforts out there, um, and this is an issue that we've been talking about for many years, uh, improving our economic and political systems. For example, E.F. Schumacher wrote a book called Small is Beautiful in 1973 that wrote a very accurate criticism of, of our economic uh, and political systems, but in some ways, in many ways, things are getting worse, not better. So it begs the question, why are these good system change ideas not being implemented? One of them is the failure to look at the whole system. Almost always, these, uh, these system change ideas uh, relate to one aspect of the system, such as campaign finance reform, advertising reform, um, better measures of success. Uh, but each one of these components is, Im is embedded in a larger system, and you can't fully, uh, you can't get very far on changing one part of the system if you don't look at the whole system and take uh, simultaneous action at key leverage points. So it's important to take a whole system view. Um, another barrier to, and this is a very important barrier to system change, has been lack of business involvement. Typically, business has not seen it as their responsibility to improve economic and political systems. But as it is increasingly shown that these systems are creating growing problems for business, uh, it's in business best interest to find ways to proactively get involved in system change and drive changes in a way that protects and benefits business as well as society rather than stepping back, not being involved, and letting the systems you know, continue to and increasingly negatively impact business. And then the final barrier to system change is probably the most important, uh, and that is lack of public awareness. The, a democracy is a great form of, of government. Uh, it's very fair uh, in many ways. But one of the problems is, with a democracy is that the average citizen doesn't have time to study complex uh, environmental and social issues. So it's very easy for the public to be misled. I gave an example earlier. You'd ask why when there's unanim virtual agreement uh, in the scientific community that climate change is a large problem being caused by humans, how could so many uh, citizens think that it's not a problem? And that, that speaks to the lack of public awareness and the, the ease with which the public can be misled. So obviously, a key component of system change is going to be honestly communicating with the public and helping them to understand what's going on in their world and what's going to happen to their children if we don't change. Okay, so let's go to um, slide number 15. Um, to, I, I developed most of uh, InnoVest's uh, rating models, so I'm, I'm quite familiar with developing lists of metrics and rating companies on various environmental and social issues. 
I developed a, a new approach to corporate responsibility and sustainability called Total Corporate Responsibility, or TCR. TCR combines traditional leading edge uh, corporate responsibility approaches uh, with um, system change efforts. So the approach provides basically a roadmap for firms uh, on sustainability and system change. The approach can also be used to develop investment products that engage the capital markets in driving system changes uh, or rewarding firms that work to improve systems rather than, uh, rather than firms that, that block system improvement, such as when firms go to government and ask to be held less responsible, something that happens frequently uh, but firms are not penalized for. Okay, um, the, basically what TCR does is provides a paradigm-shifting vision for business. Let's switch to uh, slide 16, please. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, what we do, what we do now uh, in society would be like having a strategy about what's best to, for the hand without regard to the body that uh, supports the hand. Uh, same thing with business. So what's best for the business without regards to the larger system that supports it? The new vision for, uh, that TCR is based on is the recognition that the firm is part of a larger system and ultimately cannot prosper unless the larger system prospers. Obviously, there are lots of issues on practicality that need to be addressed here, but this is the framing vision, the, the, the kind of paradigm-shifting approach. Uh, it's a movement towards system thinking, where the firm is thinking of the well-being of the system rather than its own well-being exclusively. Okay, um, so the, the TCR uh, is based on three principles, and below each one of these principles, there's about more than 50 metrics. These are traditional uh, corporate responsibility metrics, looking at um, environmental management systems, overall integration of sustainability into the corporate strategy, uh, management of the downside and the upside, looking at quantitative risk exposure, also looking at upside issues are the developing socially envir and environmentally responsible products and services, but also the approach um, measures companies on how they seek to promote or block system change. In other words, are, go are companies going to government and asking to be held more responsible or less? Are they using advertising that um, perhaps takes advantage of people's inner needs to sell products? Um, taken together, the three uh, concepts of TCR provide a vision of a sustainable world that most would agree on. It's important to have a, a vision of sustainability or some type of definition that we can agree on because without a vision, without a clear goal, we're not going to be able to get where we want. So the three concepts are interconnectedness, the idea that business is part of a larger system. Actualization has to do with the idea that uh, ultimately, the job of the firm is to help the system reach its fullest potential, help society reach its fullest potential. And the third concept, posterity, is the idea that the primary obligation of this generation is to care for future generations. So taken together, these create a vision of a sustainable world as one interconnected system, reaching its fullest potential on every level and prospering over the long term. Okay, now... I mentioned that TCR combines leading-edge corporate responsibility and system change efforts. Sustainable, system cha sustainable systems implementation is the high-level system change component of TCR. It basically involves bringing together leaders from business, government, and civil society, along with system change experts, and looking at ways to practically uh, improve our systems in ways that remove conflicts between business and society and thus allow firms to, uh, to mitigate more of their impacts. In other words, um, looking at improving our systems in ways that align what's good for the shareholder with what's good for children, with, with what's good for the environment. Um, the approach provides the whole system focus needed to achieve sustainability and system change, and it also is very focused and aware of the needs of business. Okay, so let's go to slide uh, 19 and discuss some of the principles of um, SSI. The first uh, principle has to do with systems thinking. Um, the, as I mentioned earlier, the reason our systems, main reason our systems are flawed is because they weren't developed uh, from the whole system perspective. So systems thinking means that we must consider all relevant factors if we want to develop optimal, sustainable systems. It's extremely difficult, but nevertheless required. The other, uh, another principle has to do with collaboration. 
These challenges are so complex that no single company, even a Walmart or even country, uh, could solve them. So these problems can only be solved through collaboration. So it's an important principle. Another principle has to do with simplicity. Because we're talking about something that's so complex, we need to find ways to explain these issues uh, in ways that are simple and clear so that the average person on the street can understand what we're talking about. If we're not able to communicate this in a way that, that the average citizen gets, we're going to continue to not make much progress on system change. So simple, clear communication is key. Uh, another principle has to do with the idea of evolution, not revolution. The point here is, is to avoid disruption. We're not trying to shake things up by changing systems. This is based on the idea that systems are going to change themselves, uh, and that will be extremely disruptive to society. So by seeking to practically, and in some cases incrementally, improve systems, evolve them into a better form, what humans always do improve, by doing that we will avoid disruption and avoid revolution. Pretending that our systems won't change is actually choosing the revolutionary path because we will get that type of change if we don't voluntarily try to improve our systems. Okay, another principle is the idea that we must be willing to question everything. Sometimes we take our, our ideas and systems, um, look at them as if they were sacred. For example, the idea of our economic and political ideals and systems. They are not sacred. No human idea or system is sacred. What's sacred is our children. What's sacred is life. What's sacred is that which supports life, the environment. So if any idea that we developed or system that we created threatens that which is sacred, it must be changed. Uh, our economic and political systems have no inherent right to exist in the ideas that they're based on. Uh, for example, ideas about how humans are separate from nature. Uh, these ideas, uh, we must question them if we want to improve our systems voluntarily and do the right thing for our children. Another, another principle has to do with abiding by nature's laws. We have no option to do otherwise. We must, actually we will live within nature's laws uh, one way or the other. The only question is, will we live within nature's laws voluntarily or we, will we live within it involuntarily? I think as we see increasing in environmental problems around the world, in Australia, here now in the U.S. with the fires we're seeing out west, um, it's clear that you know, we probably don't have a, a lot more time to get in line with nature's laws before nature pushes us into line involuntarily. Okay, um, the, let's go to slide 20, please. Another principle is non-judgment. This is critical. I mentioned I advise Walmart on corporate responsibility. Walmart, obviously, being one of the largest companies in the world, gets a lot of criticism from activists for their negative impacts. And in some ways, this is correct because Walmart, as with all companies, can improve some, and they should. So activist pressure for companies to improve should uh, continue. But we need to recognize that maybe roughly 80% of the negative impacts of firms cannot be mitigated and without killing the firm. So that's not a company problem. That's a system problem. And one of, the, one of the mistakes is people think that these, that these environmental and social problems are driven by CEOs and other executives that don't care. That's not at all the case. I've worked with many CEOs. Every one of them is a good person that cares about uh, the environment. They don't want to leave a legacy of environmental destruction. They certainly don't want to hurt anyone's children. But they're stuck in systems that force them to act in ways that do exactly that. So when we criticize people for, doing, for acting in a system that compels them to behave in a certain way, we put up a wall between them and us and we limit progress and, and make little progress like we've seen so far. So it's important that we uh, have non-judgment. If we want to make progress, we've got to bring business in, work with them, um, and recognize that it's not people that are, or bad intentions that are driving us down. It's bad ideas and resulting bad systems. Okay, uh, another one, another principle has to do with collective, not individual change. Mm. One of, uh, oftentimes, I've given a lot of these presentations, and many times people say, but shouldn't individuals be driving Priuses or you know, acting more energy efficiently? Um, and it's, it's true that you know, individuals can and should change, I suppose, but the reality is, is that 
Most people are just struggling to get by. They don't have time to think about longer term issues. If our expectation is that individuals will change and that's how we'll get to sustainability, we won't get to sustainability voluntarily. Instead, uh, as in nature, many different things happen at, at once and add up to a solution. So there's no one right or wrong answer here. Of course, it's important to help individual companies and people and even countries improve. But we need another level of work. And the work that we're talking about here with SSI is system change work. What we want to do is change the systems in such a way um, that it's easy for individuals to change. Right now, for example, organic food is more expensive uh, than conventionally grown food because a lot of the costs of conventional produce are not integrated into the uh, food prices. If we did economics correctly, then the organic food or the responsible product or lifestyle would be the easiest and least expensive lifestyle. Okay, another principle has to do with uh, carrot, not stick. The point here is um, not to force companies and others to change. We want to try and do this in such a way where we come up with more appealing systems that draw consumers, that draw companies towards more responsible and sustainable behavior. And I think that's possible, especially if we hold it out as a principle of action. Another principle has to do with responsibility. As I mentioned earlier, this is the overarching flaw of our systems, the failure to hold firms fully responsible. By holding firms fully responsible in a practical way over time, not in a way that shocks the system, but in a way that improves the system, we then make acting in a fully responsible and sustainable manner the profit-maximizing path for firms. So it's critical that we hold firms more responsible. Let's switch to slide number 21. Um, another principle is focusing on results. If we want to have business involved, we need to get results. So that means focusing on quick wins uh, while we're also beginning to work on longer term issues. Another principle is practicality. What that means from business perspective is that whatever the system change activity is, it must enhance the financial and competitive performance of, fir of firms or we can't expect firms to participate. It's not that business leaders won't like the idea of system change and want to be involved. It's just that the systems that they operate in won't allow them to participate. So it's not an issue of ethics. It's a simple reality that if we don't find a way for firms to make money on this, it's not going to happen. So the approach we're discussing does do that. I'll explain how that happens in a minute. Um, another principle has to do with visionary and courageous leadership. Um, it takes a lot of courage for a, a leader to uh, question existing uh, systems and structures. And this approach would not suggest that any CEO uh, question uh, these flaws uh, alone uh, publicly, because it might mean the loss of their job or the hurt of hurting of their company. Uh, but instead, we have to find a way to work together, and maybe a group of leaders can question a system that puts the company in conflict with society, shows how that hurts the company and investors as well as society, and says we need to work together to improve that. So that's the kind of communication that I would suspect we'd see from leaders with this type of effort. Another principle, again, I mentioned earlier, is inevitability. Um, system change is going to happen one way or the other. Uh, and when we consider the, the, what involuntary system change means to business, society, and especially our children, I think we see that we really only have one option, and that is to do the best we can to try and achieve voluntary system change. The final uh, principle has to do with opportunity. I know I've been talking about a lot of the uh, problems and flaws with our systems, environmental and social declines, but ultimately I believe the message I'm talking about is extremely uh, optimistic. We have an opportunity to produce a much more sustainable uh, and a much more satisfying and prosperous world than we have right now. If this is the best that humans can do, what we have right now, then we're in big trouble. We can do, I would say that we have only reached the tiniest uh, percentage of our potential. We can do far, far better than this. Uh, okay, so now let's go to slide number uh, 22. Uh, moving quickly through the remaining slides here, this, the, the structure of SSI, again, is bringing together highest level leaders from business, government, and civil society, along with system change experts that have good system change ideas. Um, and the approach would focus first on the national level, I would say, because systems are created and maintained at the national level. That's where they're controlled. 
Um, so originally the idea would be to set up some SSI system change type efforts in Australia and other countries. I'm working in the UK and also in the US. Um, and then uh, what we would do once, as, as countries uh, and leaders from those countries were working on system change, they would, they would see that their ability to change is constrained by the fact that they operate in a global economy. So what the approach would do is do what you can at the national level, establish the efforts, and then begin, as these national efforts are established, begin to work with other national efforts on a global uh, system change effort. Okay, um, key principles here are to integrate with existing sustainability efforts. Um, there's, as, as I said earlier, the nature of these things have to work together. Another key principle is that some of this work, I think, will have to be done in closed sessions because it's, leaders won't be able to talk about these issues in public uh, and little progress will be made. So part of the, part of the effort must, must be done, I think, uh, in closed session. Okay, let's go to slide 23. Three, in terms of what the work would look like of the SSI, uh, there are, uh, you could say there's some basic framing work that needs to be done. The first would be develop a preliminary vision of a sustainable world uh, for, or country if you're focusing on the national level. So, for example, with Australia, there are an infinite number of forms that a, that a sustainable Australia could take. Uh, but there are a number of factors that nearly everyone would agree on. For example, you'd have to have clean air, land, and water. Basic rights should be protected and basic needs met. And most importantly, future generations should prosper on every level. So with that preliminary vision of a sustainable world, you can begin to set the goal for where you want to go. Then the next step would be to get honest about the current reality. Identify environmental, social, and other trends, and what the likely impact on future generations of these are. Once you're clear on the current reality and where you want to get to, the next step is to identify what's standing in between. What are the barriers to sustainability and system change? These occur on many levels. Technological barriers, lifestyle barriers, our flawed systems that I've been talking about, and our limited worldviews. Basically, our views of reality are incorrect in some ways. Um, and then once you've identified the current reality, uh, where you want to be, what's standing in the way, the next step is to develop short-term and longer-term action to um, to, to address the barriers and achieve sustainability. So let's go to slide 24. Here's an example of some of the quick wins. As I mentioned earlier, this kind of effort, uh, it's, if business is involved, it's going to be important to get some success up front. Uh, so there are a number of different things that could, could be done. When we're talking about system change, some might say there are no quick wins because these, these issues are so complex. So just beginning on some of these things might be an example of a quick win. But this slide right here, 24, shows some examples of possible quick wins. One might be to help small, medium, and large companies move to uh, best practice on corporate responsibility. There's a huge opportunity out there to help businesses improve their financial performance while they're helping Australian society. Another example of a quick win might be in the, in the regulatory area to work with regulators to help them change the rules of the game or change the incentives for, for, for firms uh, in ways that uh, promote responsible behavior and also strengthen the economy. Uh, one example of that might be raising fossil fuel taxes while concurrently lowering income taxes. So in other words, that the tax code is used to motivate uh, positive behavior, creating jobs, for example, uh, and um, and motivate, you know, reduction of pollution. Okay, so another one, um, another quick win might be with civil society. This has to do with raising public awareness. I mentioned earlier the importance of, um, of lowering, uh, of raising public awareness and helping people understand uh, what's happening with environmental and social conditions. So that's a key effort. Another one is one I already mentioned ha having to do with the capital markets you can begin to launch uh, system change funds based on TCR or other models that get the capital markets to encourage companies to work for system changes that help business and society. That's one of the highest leverage things that can be done because business is probably the largest driver of unsustainability. They have the most negative environmental and social impacts, direct or indirect, and they're controlled by the capital markets. So if we can get capital markets to push firms to work for system change, it's one of the highest leverage things we can do. Okay, let's go to slide 25. Here's an example of some of the longer-term system changes needed. Uh, these, for example, have to do with emulating nature, 
removing conflicts between business and society, um, separating the regulator from the regulated entity so that the regulator can fully regulate, uh, and you know, taking away the ability of uh, firms to mislead the public uh, for the purpose of selling products. Okay, let's go to slide 26. The overall approach I mentioned had to be profitable for firms. So uh, it is in the sense that what we're talking about is still a, only a small component of a uh, company's corporate responsibility strategy. Probably 95% of the work or more is traditional lowering your environment on social impacts. Only a small part is working with other leaders on these system changes. Doing this work can help companies because, for example, you work with regulators on regulations that give you, give you responsible products a competitive advantage. Uh, it can help enhance reputation because the company will be seen as being involved in the most advanced corporate responsibility strategy. And it can help costs or other ways that are listed here. So let's go to slide 27. So in summary, I would say that, uh, that it, it is ultimately our, our short-sighted ideas that produced our unsustainable systems, and it's these systems that are driving unsustainability. If we want to achieve a prosperous world for future generations and address our problems now, we must begin to focus much more on system change. The challenge of doing this is immense. Some might say it's impossible, but given the alternative and the impacts on our children, we have an obligation to at least try, to at least begin. And once we begin to take some action on system change, once we get on the path, additional answers and actions will become obvious. Now, um, one of the things I should, I should say, I mentioned that this is a, this is a great opportunity. There, we already know most of what needs to be done. There are many good system change ideas out there and lots of technologies that would help. Um, so we're already working uh, with some people in Australia on this. I believe Julie Bertels is in the room. Julie, if you're there, would you stand for a minute? Anyone who has questions or an interest in this type of system change approach activity in Australia could ask Julie. Could ask Julie. Um, thanks, Julie. And uh, just in conclusion, I'd, I would like to say that I wish you uh, the greatest of luck with the excellent work that you're doing uh, with Moss and those supporting Moss. And I'm glad to be working with you. Thank you. Frank can actually hear that applause. So on that note, um, we'd like to welcome Frank to the phone. We have a couple of microphones that are going to go through the room. And we won't have time for a, a whole array of questions. We've got a very tight schedule today, people needing to get on international flights, etc. So we might just quickly go straight into questions. And um, I know Amanda Little had a question back here, so if we can take the first microphone to Amanda. If anyone else has got a question, please put your hand up so the microphone can be ready. So please speak into that microphone so Frank can hear you and it's being recorded. Good morning, Frank. Good morning, Frank. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Hi. Uh, Amanda Little from uh, Edelman Public Relations here in Sydney. Frank, I was very interested in your talk and my question is around uh, working with the media and changing awareness. My experience and observation of the media is that it's deeply embedded in the current system and when you try and talk about things which are total systems approach, it's very difficult to get journalists to write stories about things like that. I was just wondering what your experience um, in the United States and other countries was around... Uh, getting the media to uh, write about and think about some of the ideas you talked about today? Well, I, I think um, it's my impression that awareness of sustainability and related issues is growing exponentially. Um, Australia provides a perfect example of, uh, of an issue, climate change, that went from being not important to being very important in a short amount of time. So as I said in my talk, there's no easy answer uh, to this, but I do think there's a great opportunity in advertising and media to begin to uh, craft messages that um, enhance and support society. Ultimately, uh, the reality is that the way humans are living on this planet is we're degrading our environmental, the environmental and social systems to keep us alive. So, it's, you know, that's the truth. So the question is how, how well can we tell the truth to the public? I think a big part of the problem has been, as I mentioned in the talk, complexity. These issues are, the average citizen doesn't have time to study what's going on, so it's incumbent on us as communicators to 
put these in extremely simple and clear terms so that the average person on the street understands uh, what's at stake. You know, what's the specific answer? I don't think anybody knows that, but I think if, if enough of us, especially, you know, experts like you and the media, get together and work on this, so we can figure it out. It's, it's just a question of um, what, what level of priority or urgency we put on uh, communicating this to the public. Certainly no silver bullet. We've got a question over here. Uh, morning from Australia, Frank. Uh, although it must be quite late in the day there, I think, uh, for you. So good evening. No, probably not that late. <laughs> um, Gavin, Coopy, Gavin Coopy from uh, Authentic Values. Um, I had a, a question which was really about a flaw that you, you possibly didn't include, uh, which is a very large one, which is that mass uh, shareholder capitalism is driving most of the corporate systems around the world and is innately unsustainable because its core focus is profit and the movement of profit from one company to another without regard to the outcomes of that company's operations on individuals and uh, therefore overall its responsibilities. Um, and I was just wondering, that's quite a big element of system change because you're really talking about trying to change the globally dominant model of corporate behaviour. Um, so I was wondering what your thoughts were on how you would approach uh, longer term trying to move, move on to other forms of ownership that might be more responsible. Well, the, um, the, the issue of uh, shareholder capitalism in, in its current form is, I think, addressed in the clause that I discussed there. One of them, for example, was the way that we measure success. If, if as a society, we measure success with only GNP, then that means GNP is the roll-up of corporate profitability, basically. So our system forces us to focus on shareholder returns and put that ahead of everything else. So the, the question is, how do we switch to a system that more broadly, accurately, and successfully measures the well-being of society? There are a number of uh, attempts to try and do that around the world, including in Australia. I, I understand that you have, a, I think, a great initiative going on down there to, to better measure the well-being of Australian society. But I, th these efforts have been around for a while and have not gained a lot of traction. I think the reason for that is that we're not taking a systemic approach. Uh, th you know, there's no easy answer to your question. You, you, you're really, you're asking, how do we change the, the whole economic system? that so many of our lives are, are depend, are depend upon. But one thing that will help in changing that is the recognition that that system is going to change one way or the other. So it's really a question of how much disruption do we need to feel or in the individual's life, how much pain do you need to feel before you change? Clearly this system, if we continue on our current path, is going to create increasing problems for society. The question is, can we be smart enough to look ahead coming down the pike and begin to modify our activities now. I think the way to do that is, there's no silver bullet, as, as someone said, perhaps you, but one piece that's missing is the whole system approach. From the whole system approach, what we do is look at, we go beyond existing systems and structures, set capitalism to the side for a minute, because capitalism, capitalism is not the primary issue. Capitalism is a service meant to serve something higher, which is the well-being of society. So we have we begin a dialogue uh, in society around what's it all about, what's the purpose of this, and try and describe the world that we want, get honest about where we're at now, identify what's standing in the way of getting there, and just like you know business people do, come up with practical strategies to begin to address these barriers and, and move forward. I, I think that's 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 part of it. I want to make a, a key point though here, and that is that. Uh, what I'm talking about and what I said in my presentation is, is still, for a while, going to be a small part of the work. Most of the work is going to involve, uh, for example, the great presentations you're about to hear today and tomorrow, looking at leading edge corporate responsibility. That's probably 90% of the work that needs to be done. However, we're still there still is a need for this high-level system change approach. And as I mentioned, I'm working with Julie and others to get something like that going there. So. If any of you are interested in it, you could talk to me or talk to Julie. Uh, and, you know, again, no easy answers, but, you know, the, the most complex challenges facing society have never been easy. You know, the question is, are we going to develop the will to make it happen? I think Australia right now has the gift of some severe environmental problems, 
that provides a motivation to take some significant action. Uh, you know, it, for many, I mentioned in my talk, Australia is in a great position to, I think, become a world leader on what will become the most important aspect of sustainability. That is business change. You're in a great position to do it, I think, because Australia has a strong economy, a small population relative to other developed countries, and as I said, severe environmental problems creating strong incentives for change. So I think, you know, I, I, was, I was around 15 years ago um, with Innovest and others talking to Goldman Sachs and Harvard Business School and many others about uh, why this stuff is important. Now, finally, we're beginning to see the mainstream institutions, like I just mentioned, get involved in it. So this is becoming mainstream. There's, there's another issue right now. This issue of system change is something the mainstream will be talking about in the future. But I don't think we have 15 years to make this mainstream. We've got to try to find a way to address uh, address this now, and it's got to happen, I think, through collaboration. That that's the, the effort we're trying to start here in Australia. Frank, Frank, we're going to need to leave it there. We've already gone over time. Uh, thank you so much for your contribution. It's great that we've been able to minimise our footprint to some degree by having him here. That was a terrible line. I apologise for that. But I think between his accent and the line, I think we could still understand most of the, the conversation and the input. Uh, Julie Bertels um, is very much driving Frank's work here in Australia. He'll be coming back out in Australia. He'll actually be here in Australia early next year. We're going to do quite a bit of work with Frank. This has been a great scene setter in terms of the level of thinking that we need to have if we're going to actually move forward and achieve the sustainability that we're looking for. So on behalf of uh, everybody here in the room in Sydney, Frank, thank you so much.